Looking Always at the Heart, July 23, 1979 The diseases of the heart are chronic. They can easily flame up and it is very hard to curb them. So as we gradually correct and remedy these diseases, we should at least try to get some calm in the process so that the jitta can be cool and peaceful. This is good and proper for us as bhikkhus. If we cannot find any calm in our hearts, then we will be like the lay people, and there will only be restlessness and agitation inside the heart. We must therefore focus our attention on the truth and tamma of the Lord Buddha. In every text, the Lord Buddha told us to take care of and restrain the jitta and the sense organs. When the sense organs come into contact with the sense objects, one should not delight in them, like forms, sounds, smells, tastes, and tactile objects. Listen. The Lord Buddha said that we should not take delight in them. We must take this to heart. The Tamma has been well taught, and what it teaches has no mistake in it. It teaches that we should not take delight in forms, sounds, smells, tastes, and tactile objects when they come into contact with the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, and body. And how can we practice so that we don't take delight in these things? We need to have discipline and control and investigation to prevent the jitta from taking delight in or having aversion for them, or else we cannot be called practitioners. We must constantly concentrate on taking care of the jitta, for this is the duty of the practitioner, one who takes care of his heart. Apart from taking care of the jitta, one must also nourish it. This nourishment is the calming of the jitta, or the calming of the heart, providing the heart with coolness and peace. Then we must also investigate with banya for the purpose of uprooting those harmful things inside the heart. This is the way of giving nourishment to the heart by our diligent effort in our various modes of exertion. I was a young bhikkhu once and was possessed with all sorts of gilesas. This I have never forgotten. I don't remember much about the dukkha that I experienced as a layperson, but I remember very well the dukkha that arose in my heart as a bhikkhu, and this experience of dukkha taught me a very good lesson. When I was studying the texts, all the Gilesas, Dangha, and Asava never seemed to appear or become apparent. But when I began to practice, all of these Gilesas, Dangha, and Asava came up from nowhere. They really gave me a strong fight, and I had to struggle with them, with all that I had. During the days of my practice, I could never gain any ease and comfort while doing nothing. This is part of my temperament. Whatever I do, I really commit myself to and the determination that I had for Tamma was not just mere determination, I was determined for the Tamma of deliverance from Dukkha, and this determination was firmly embedded inside my heart. Before I took up the practice of the Sasana Tamma, I was already convinced that it is possible to attain the Magga Pala and Nibbana. There was no doubt in this because I had a strong belief in the Magga Pala and Nibbana, although I was not totally certain of my conviction. But when I went to Dana John Man and heard his Tamma, I was then totally convinced and believed in the Magga, Pala, and Nibbana. Totally 100% was the belief. All my doubts about the Magga, Pala, and Nibbana had been dispelled because Tana John Man had shown them to me in every respect. And so my determination was total without having anything to bring it down. So, as it was like that, my exertion and diligent effort were at their maximum. So when I took up the practice, I really concentrated on my work of Pawana, so that I could get to see the marvels of the Jitta again. I had experienced this only three times in all the time that I had spent studying the texts, and I was really determined to master and take hold of this Jitta. I would not retreat, but struggled, coped, and combated the kilesas that had been ruling over the heart for so long. I had to do it to the utmost of my ability by putting my life at stake. Therefore, my exertion had to be very intense, and I had to experience a lot of dukkha and hardship. The dukkha that arises from one's exertion is similar to the dukkha that a boxer experiences in the ring. He doesn't pay much attention to it because he is being very careful and on his guard, and is totally committed in his effort in knocking down his opponent. So he is hardly bothered by this dukkha. It was the same way with me. I forgot all about this dukkha, the dukkha that arose from my exertion, and did not even think about it. This was because my exertion was so intense that I was constantly fighting and fighting. And it cannot be beyond your ability, so please listen well and take this to heart. All of us have the gilesas in us, and we have been carrying them with us for countless lives. It is my conviction that as long as the jitta still possesses avidda within it, it will always continue on to take up new births and then die again and again. 
I believe in this conviction firmly, and nobody in the whole universe in the entire three worlds could ever come and contravene this belief, because I strongly believe that when one dies, then one also takes up birth. This is what I believe, and I have found verification of it as I have practiced and attained the more subtle Tamma. I could see the cause and the source of birth, aging, sickness, and death. And what is the cause? It is the same old cause that functioned in the past, and this is avidza patsya sankara. Ignorance causes the arising of sankara. It cannot be anything else but this. We have all experienced dukkha, so we should not see anything good in this world, but just the buddha, tamma, and sankha, or in short, just the tamma. It is only the tamma, the teaching of the Lord Buddha, that can uplift us from dukkha through our exertion in applying this tamma, using it to help and uplift ourselves. Please don't ever imagine that you can find any marvel or rarity from anything in this world to the extent where you totally forget about your exertion, the truth, and tamma and turning this truth and tamma, which is the most supreme, into something useless or worthless by seeing those things that have no worth or value as the real essence. This is a misperception and is the understanding which follows the commands of the Gilesas, which we have always followed in the past without ourselves being aware of it. Tamma must always be opposing the Gilesas because the Gilesas always oppose tamma. For this reason, we must accumulate and develop Satibanya so that we have enough of it to combat the Gilesas. Satibanya is the means or tool with which to combat the Gilesas. Not a single type of Gilesa can surpass Satibanya, Sadha, and Virya, diligent effort. You must be firm and tough because you are a man and a bhikkhu. Be earnest and resolute. Don't be weak or discouraged. Both discouragement and weakness are the Gilesas. They are not the Tamma. This is not the way of Tamma, and this way of thinking is not in line with Tamma. This kind of thinking is on the side of Samudaya, which will cause more Gilesas to afflict us with more Dukkha, thus creating more discouragement in us. The result that we seek will never appear, and it will be contrary to our purpose and intention and our determination for Tamma. The Gilesas are always permeating and hiding within us, so we cannot be off guard. This is because, as as soon as we are off guard, they will hit us. Remember this point well, because the Gilesas are always waiting. As soon as the Banya is off guard, then the Gilesas will emerge. As soon as we are off guard, then Sankara will begin to concoct. As far as Sanya is concerned, it is a lot more subtle than Sankara, as far as I can observe this Kanta. When Sankara concocts, it stirs suddenly, but Sanya doesn't stir at all. As one establishes the kanthas to become still and quiet, and one begins to observe to see which kantha will arise first, sanya kantha will slowly permeate out like ink permeating across a piece of blotting paper. It slowly flows out until it creates a picture, a mental image, and then it will cause sankara to begin to concoct the various stories following the image that has been created. All of these pictures or images that are created by Sanya all come out by themselves. Sanya draws up the images by itself, and then Sankara takes hold of these images and begins to concoct the various concepts and stories about them. This is how it will happen when we are off our guard. If it is hard, we should endure it. We should not be concerned about this difficulty. As practitioners, we should never be bothered by the hardships that arise from our exertion. The Lord Buddha went before us, and he experienced all sorts of hardships and difficulties. So when he taught the world the Tamma, he selected and refined the teaching, and came up with the Madhima Badibada, the middle way of practice. This is the shortest and most direct way. Please follow this path, no matter how difficult or easy it may be, for this is the shortest and most direct way to go. Let us not be concerned with the hardship, for if we tread the roundabout ways, we may eventually get lost and not reach our destination. We must stick to this path. We must make our hearts brave and courageous. Be tactful and versatile, and watch out for the Gilesas, for they will whisper to us right inside the Jitta. Please don't ever think that the Gilesas are anywhere else but right inside the Jitta. In the scriptures there are only to be found the names of the Gelesas, or the names of Tamma, or the names of greed, hatred, and delusion, or the names of Raga Tanha, be it in the book of the discourses, or the discipline, or the Abhitamma. They only contain the names of Tamma and the names of all sorts of Gelesas, Tanha, and Asva that manifest themselves inside the hearts of all sentient beings. The Lord Buddha expounded and pointed to the heart, but a few years after he had passed away, the Tamma was collected and put into the scriptures so that it could be used as a signpost pointing out the way. 
We then study these texts and become attached to them by taking up the knowledge that we have committed to memory as our own knowledge. One thinks that one is wise and discerning, although the Keleses are constantly consuming one's heart and burning it worse than an erupting volcano. Such is the way when we commit things to memory. It can only increase the Keleses by letting us think that now we know the truth and that we are very wise from doing a lot of studying. But this is the wrong way of learning. The correct way is to learn about the names of the Keleses and Asua, and the technique and method of coping and correcting and getting rid of these Gelezes, Danha, and Asava. Then we must take up this learning and apply it inside our hearts, for this is where all the Gelezes, Danha, and Asava are. Where are Raga, lustful desire, and Dosa, hatred and anger, found if they are not found within the heart? They are found in the heart, and this is where they exhibit or manifest themselves. Where are cravings and ambitions? The texts or the scriptures never exhibit the greed, hatred, and delusion for us to see, but all of these things actually exhibit themselves right within our hearts. They are right here, so we must turn around and hit them right at this point. The Gelezes are found here. Don't look in the scriptures, for that is merely a compass pointing towards the heart. I am not speaking in contempt. There is both internal and external tamma. The texts are merely the external tamma, which serves as a compass or a signpost pointing back towards the heart so that we can practice and develop this heart. That is really the message of the texts. Don't turn into worms eating up the paper. Let's do it at this point, because this is where the Lord Buddha attained his enlightenment. Be courageous and joyful. In your practice, you must always use sati and banya, mindfulness and wisdom, because they are the most important weapons. In your exertion, sati is the foremost. It is the primary weapon. Even in the beginning stages of practice, you must depend on sati as your primary weapon. And when you begin to investigate with banya, you must also depend on sati. That is why sati is always vital. That is why the Lord Buddha said that sati is always needed in every circumstances. The Lord Buddha said all circumstances. There is no exception at all. Whatever you do, whether it is the internal or external work, you must always have mindfulness. You really must try to develop your sati. Don't be interested in or pay attention to other things. Don't ever have the idea that forms, sounds, smells, tastes, tactile objects, or other people are harmful to us. They are merely the creations or concoctions of the heart that create images and concepts to fool ourselves, bother and disturb our heart. The one who really stirs up trouble is the heart itself. It is the heart that creates all sorts of troubling affairs. You must always look at this point. When you have continuously observed and watched this point, then you will eventually come to realize that all the troubles that have been created come out from this point. This you will find out for yourselves in the heart. Once the heart comes to calm, then all the troubles also disappear. During that time, the world is not apparent, although the world is there, but the heart doesn't give it a thought, because at that time the heart, knowingness, awareness, remains just with itself, not concocting any concepts about anything. It is likewise with the five khandhas that are found within us. Once the jitta does not form any concepts about them, then they become just like any other objects that we see with our eyes. They are like the four elements, the earth, water, air, and fire. These things form no concepts of themselves. It is we who form these concepts and give them names or labels, like calling them earth, water, air, and fire. That thing is a mountain, a tree, a man, or a woman. We just keep on forming concepts without end. This is the way of building up insanity because there is no mindfulness. But when the jitta doesn't form any concepts and is very cautious and watching itself very carefully, then it is as if there is nothing there. Then we can really have fun in analyzing and investigating the main cause that creates all the problems inside the heart. But if the jitta still cherishes the various concepts and thoughts about this and that, then this is really the work of the Gelesas pushing us outward. The Gelesas fool us and lead us to go out and be involved with the external things, rather than being concerned with the internal things. They fool us and lead us to go and chase after shadows. The real Gelesas are found within the heart, but we never have the chance to capture them. That is why we must concentrate all our effort right at this point. If we cannot yet pinpoint the spot where the jitta is concocting the various concepts, then we must depend on our meditation object to take us there. 
Be solely aware of just the meditation object and nothing else. It can be butto, 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 or anything else. But the point is to only be concentrated on that particular object. Constantly focus your attention just on this meditation object, so that eventually your awareness will become continuous. Then the flow of the jitta that goes out to the various objects will now begin to be drawn back, as it cannot withstand the power of discipline and control. This flow of the jitta will steadily return back to the jitta itself, which will then calm down. One will gain coolness, and one will be able to see this very clearly. This is one aspect of practice, and it is the same way with the investigation of the body. Every piece and part of this body is a sulpa and bartikula, loathsome and filthy. This is the truth. Our perception and view that runs contrary to tamma, the seeing that this body is I and mine, as people and animals, this is precisely the kilesas. You must therefore try to investigate and analyze this body in both aspects of bartikula, or filthiness, and the tatu, or elements. And what are the elements? They are the earth, water, air, and fire, and mano the knowing element, which is the heart. You should also investigate that. As far as people are concerned, after they have been born and have died, does the body have any value or worth once it becomes a corpse? Is there any value in a dead person? There is none. It cannot even compare with a fish. When a fish dies, one can take it to the market, and similarly with all the other kinds of animals. Every piece and part of them becomes useful after they die because it can be sold in the market. But with people, once they die, their bodies are not useful at all. In order to be useful, we must therefore do what we can now whilst we are still living, especially we who are bhikkhus because we are of a special breed. Our duty and work is to cultivate and develop ourselves so that we can release ourselves from the Galeasas and Dasa and we have full support from the lay people without them coming here to bother us at all. You must therefore exert to your fullest, be resolute and earnest. In your investigation of death, you must investigate so that you can really get to see the truth of it. In this whole world of samsara, every person, every man, every woman, every animal must all die. Wherever they may be, there is always a cemetery. Even right here, where we are sitting, there is a cemetery, for there are all sorts of little animals or organisms that die all over the place. It is just, we never think about it in this way. We don't think of it as a cemetery, we just call it a zala, or assembly hall. In our bodies there can be found many organisms living inside us, like the germs, for instance. They are one form of animal. And inside this body there is nothing that one can call attractive or beautiful. You must investigate and analyze to see according to the truth of the Lord Buddha. The Gelesas tend to see it as something beautiful, as people, as animals, as I, as mine, and this attachment to this view, our Upadana, is much more tenaciously fixed than a nail driven into a piece of wood. It cannot be easily dislodged. This is because of the influence of the Gelesas, or our misperception of things. We must therefore uproot and correct this misperception, which is truly the work of the Gelesas with the Tamma of the Lord Buddha, using Zati, Banya, Sadha, and Virya, diligent effort. We must get to see it clearly. We have to establish our perception so that we can really see this body passing away, because death is the undeniable truth. So why can't the jitta accept this truth? What is the cause or the reason for it? And it is the same way with bhartikola or filthiness. It is all over this body, and it is also the truth. It is really that way, so why cannot the jitta see it like that? What is the reason? You must therefore probe and examine until you can really see it as such. You must open it up and reveal it with your sati and banya. This work and undertaking is your work, and nobody can help you do this work. Your teacher can merely point out the various means and techniques of doing it. In doing this work, you must do it yourself. You are your own refuge. When you have heard the instruction from your teacher and learned the various techniques, then you must use and apply these techniques in your practice. The benefit that you gain while listening to the discourse of your teacher is that either you will gain calm or you will learn the various techniques and methods of practice. But other than that, you must help yourselves. This is essential. You should really get into it. I really have great concern for all of you, and that is why I always have to give you instruction. Although it can be hard on me, I try to struggle along. We are living in a Buddhist country which is the most suitable environment for us to strive for the elimination of dukkha by the means of our exertion, and this is our sole duty as bhikkhus. 
I try my best to prevent other people from coming to disturb your exertion in your practice, because the most vital factor for a practitioner who is striving for the realization and penetration of truth is in his exertion, that is, in his walking jangama and sitting in samadhi pawana, having mindfulness as the most important tool in that exertion. This is more vital than anything else. I do not see any other work in the world that is more challenging than the work that we are doing, such that I could be led into doing anything else, like building projects that might interrupt the exertion and ruin this most important work. I only do this extracurricular work when it is extremely necessary, but if it is not really necessary, I would not do it or allow anyone else to do it. I want you to do this work. That is, you should concentrate all of your effort that you have spent in doing other things on the work of overcoming and uprooting the gelesas. When we have many gelesas in ourselves, then we experience a lot of dukkha, and this dukkha is caused by nothing else but the gelesas right within our hearts. Please really take this to heart, and do keep in mind that the intensity of your dukkha is proportional to the intensity of the gelesas. There is nothing else that can cause the heart trouble and hardship, but just the gelesas. Please listen well and take this to heart, and really see the menace of the gelesas. Then you will be able to exert to your fullest. It is the only way to catch up with the gelesas Danha and Asava, which have been so powerful and domineering for such a long time, and have been so for countless aeons. So are we still willing to go on being born and dying again and again? In these three worlds of existence, who is the one who stands out as the most extraordinary? There is nobody else but the Lord Buddha. He was the first to truly realize the peril of the gelesas. Apart from him, nobody could perceive this. No one could perceive the danger of lobha, dosa, and moha, greed, hatred, and delusion, or raga danha, lustful desire. Everybody was obsessed with and deceived by them, and had to wander in the cycle of births and deaths over and over again, without being able to find anything definite or certain. The only thing that was certain was their gamma. But again, what they had done, that is, what kind of gamma they had made could not be of any guarantee either, because they did not know what they had done or kept an account of their deeds. The Lord Buddha saw the danger of greed, hatred, and delusion, and he exerted to the utmost of his ability, putting his life at stake and striving and struggling against the gelesas until finally attaining victory and becoming the world's greatest teacher. He attained the pure heart, and this is the knowledge and realization of the Lord Buddha, which differs from the knowledge and realization found in the three worlds of existence. No one else could have attained this knowledge that can be used to cope with, suppress, or defeat the gelesas and all those things which are harmful to the heart, as the Lord Buddha did. He then taught us how to achieve it. We have all set up our determination to come here to listen to the Tamma of the Lord Buddha so that we can take it up and practice with it. We have all set up our determination to come here to listen to the Tamma of the Lord Buddha so that we can take it up and practice it, and it is only we who can practice it to the utmost of our ability. You must therefore commit yourself to this work. I would really like to see you experience the calm that will arise from your meditation practice. Furthermore, I would also like to see you use Banya in your investigation, following what I have explained to you concerning the internal and external objects or the investigation of the body. But if you are inclined to investigate the external objects, then you must set them up in front of your mind. Whether it is the form of a man or a woman, you must take the form that is the most detrimental or harmful to your chastity. In the beginning, if you are not certain of yourself, then you should not set up this form too close to you, but instead put it at quite a distance. You must establish this form and make it break down, decompose, go rotten, and disperse. Establish it with the vultures and dogs scavenging and devouring this body. Set up as many forms or bodies as you like. Establish all of them so that they appear loathsome, filthy, and as a living cemetery. Then you must turn this inwards into your own body, and then compare your own body with those bodies. You have to investigate this again and again and again. You have to coerce the jitta to traverse this path. You must not let it go out to perceive all the attractive and pretty things. For is it really pretty, beautiful, or attractive? Of course not, there is no such thing. This is merely looking for trouble. The gelesas create trouble for us, and we tend to believe in them. Where is this charm and beauty? All there is is a collection of filth. 
We must look into this filth so that we can see it very clearly following the way that the Lord Buddha described it to us. You should really investigate it. Then you should bring it closer and closer at the time when, having investigated, you notice that the jitta has become bold and courageous. Move it closer and closer towards you so that you can see it very clearly. Next, you must form the image of beauty and spread the image of a sulpa or loathsomeness all over it, similar to the way you might pour petrol over something and then set a match to it, letting it go up in flames. This is the technique of Satipanya, and it is up to each individual to come up with it, for they are all magga, or path to enlightenment. Sankara is concoction. If it is the Gilesas that influence this concoction of Sankara, then it falls on the side of Samudaya, the creator of Dukkha. But if Sankara is influenced to concoct the truth of Tamma, then it is the means of correcting and overcoming the Gilesas, similar to the way one analyzes and investigates the parts of the body in their various aspects of Asulpa, loathsomeness, or Bartikula, filthiness, as a living cemetery, and as it decomposes until it eventually breaks down into the four elements of earth, water, fire, and air. These Sankara fall on the side of Magga, the path. This is the means of correcting and uprooting the perception of beauty of an individual, of people, or of animals, so that one can see them decompose and break down into the four elements of earth, water, fire, and air. How then can one have any affection for this body? It is merely earth, water, air, and fire. It is the same way with a pile of corpses. Does anyone have any affection for these corpses? When one looks at these corpses, there can only be sadness and sorrow, aversion and creepy feelings for them. How then can one see this body as attractive and beautiful? One must investigate this again and again repeatedly. Satipanya must force one to make the jitta tread on this path of investigation continually, and then one will be fighting and battling with the gilesas. If we only investigate this way occasionally, once in a long while, then it is not possible to consider this to be the work of investigation to combat the Gilesas. This is useless. This is not the way of exerting for the sake of Tamma and the truth. As a follower of the Lord Buddha, you must be earnest and resolute. Really commit yourselves in this work. There are many techniques of Banya that we can come up with. If we can calm the jitta with the means of sati and banya, then we must do so. And if we can calm the jitta with the means of a parigamma object like buddha, then we must use that particular method. Or if we can calm down the jitta by our command, that is, if we can calm the jitta down any time we want to, then it means that we already know the way of getting the jitta to calm down. Then you must investigate with banya. You must not remain idle and lie clinging to this state of calm. I was stuck in this state of calm before, and I have told you this many times, so I shall not repeat it again. If one clings to one samadhi, then one can only gain just this samadhi, and one will never be able to progress along the path. But when one begins to develop banya, then one begins to see all the things that come into contact and be involved with oneself, and one can manage to cut them down and get rid of them. Then one can search and dig for them further, struggle with them, cope with them, and eventually destroy them with the means of our sati and banya. This is the way of developing our sati banya to become strong, piercing, bright, sharp, and absorbed in this investigation. And it is up to each individual practitioner to devise his own different techniques of sati and banya. What has been elaborated here is only presented in general terms. And it is up to each practitioner to come up with the different specific means of coping with his problem. When you have come up with your own technique, then this becomes your own possession, and you should not let what the teacher has presented to you slip out of your hands and go down the drain, for this will be of no benefit to you. You must take what the teacher has given you as your source of investment in your business of practicing, so that you can come up with more profit. No matter how much one has studied in higher education, one cannot help but become the tool of the Gilesas if one doesn't have any tamma inside one's heart. The Gilesas can really enjoy using one who has learned a lot and studied a lot. 
when there is no tamma inside the heart of one who has learned and studied a lot, and who is an influential person, he can only create a lot of damage and trouble for others and himself without him realizing it. This is because one's lopa or greed, and one's ambition, and one's delusion in one's power and position of influence blocks one from seeing these things and from being aware that one has done wrong to other people. But if one has some tamma, then one must know. Why be so greedy? When one dies, one just lies in a coffin. The bhikkhus just come and chant the kusala tamma, the meritorious tamma. But once the body has been cremated, all that is left is just bones and ashes. So why be obsessed with greed? When one has enough to eat and a place to live, that really is enough. Why then be so greedy? Greed never makes people happy, and neither does one's hatred and anger make one happy. It is the same way with ragatanha, sensual lust. When it arises, it really makes people struggle like dogs in heat. Where can any happiness be found? But when all these things disappear, then one doesn't grasp or struggle for things. When the jitta calms down, it will not be grasping at things. And when one has totally got rid of all of these disturbing influences, then there will be no grasping or struggling inside one's heart at all. Nothing can disturb or bother one any more, and this is what the Lord Buddha means by freedom. One can then see very clearly that what was harmful to oneself was one's greed, one's delusion, one's hatred, and one's sensual lust. They are like heaps of fire, or like volcanoes erupting and burning one's heart constantly. Before we never saw their harm, but now we can see it very clearly. Once one has learned the nature of the Gilesas, Tanha, and Asava, and has dispersed and scattered them from within one's heart, then wherever one looks outside and sees other people, one cannot help but understand every action that people take, because one now understands the driving force that urges people and oneself to do these things, because they are of the same nature. The things that people do are usually driven by the Gilesas, but they don't realize that. You must therefore try to learn the deceptions and tricks of the Gilesas within your hearts. Get to see them very clearly. You must be very careful in observing your heart. Take care of it well. When greed, hatred, and delusion, and ragatanha arise, please realize that they arise out of the heart, because it is the heart that creates them. It is the heart that conjures them up, and it is the heart that is always in the state of hunger. You must look at the heart and investigate what it is hungry for. You have to analyze the object of hunger so that the heart will get to know the nature of this object and then lose its curiosity and hunger for it. For instance, with ropa or form, the form of a woman is inimical and harmful to a man. One must investigate this form or body to really see the truth of it. Not that it is a man or a woman, but that it is just made up of various bodily parts, like the hair of the head, the hair of the body, the nails, the teeth, the skin, the flesh, and the sinews, for example. Apart from that, there is just filth all over the body. How can there be any beauty in it? Then one must mentally decompose the body. When a person dies, his body slowly decomposes and becomes rotten and fetid, and eventually scatters and disperses into earth, water, air, and fire. Get the heart to see this very clearly. Then this misperception, this presumption and assumption will steadily diminish. It will lessen and lessen. The truth will increasingly become more distinct. The truth of asulpa, loathsomeness, partikula, filthiness, and the truth of the four elements of earth, water, fire, and air. They will all become obvious. The truth about the four elements is the truth on a very subtle level. When one has entered into the knowledge of the four elements, then one has entered into the subtle truth. What then can come and bother the jitta? This is the way of correcting the jitta. This is the way of correcting ourselves. We must take a good hold of sati and banya. We must not remain idle. We must come up with the various techniques and means and methods that will develop ourselves. I really want to see all of you experience the tamma, for it is within a hand's reach, because it is right within our hearts. 
the attainment of deliverance from all of these things is right within the heart, and all the kelesas are also found right within this heart. The sati and banya, mindfulness and wisdom, that will penetrate and pierce the kelesas are also found right within ourselves. But why can't we pierce and penetrate the kelesas? On the other hand, when the kelesas want to pierce us, they seem to be able to do so very efficiently. When we want to pierce the Gilesas, all we can do is to poke at their shadows, not the real Gilesas themselves. We have always been deceived by the Gilesas to go after something else other than them. The real Gilesas are right within our hearts. The deceptions are found right within our hearts, but the Gilesas that deceive us draw up the pictures and images and project them to the outside and fool us to go and chase after shadows. So we never seem to be able to achieve anything. We must now turn around to look inside to find where the principal culprit is. It is right within the heart. When one attains calm, it is inside the heart, because when the Gilesas are subdued, they are subdued within the heart. And Satipanya, the tools to curb the Gilesas, are also found within the heart. Be really earnest and really get into it. When we have attained some calm, then it will be possible for us to see clearly what the Jitta is like. We will be able to differentiate between the Jitta and the Kanthas. Even though it might not be clearly distinct, we will at least see the difference between them. The calmness, cool-heartedness, and brightness of the Jitta will become apparent, corresponding to the intensity of our exertion in correcting and overcoming the Gilesas. The enormous change in the jitta will come when one begins to investigate with banya. The more the gilesas are being eliminated by banya, then the more skillful and adaptable will be the jitta. The conditions of the jitta, namely feelings, perceptions, thoughts, and awareness, will steadily change and become more and more subtle as we progress in our practice and exertion. All of these are samudhi, or mundane, and when all of the things that are involved with the jitta, even the most subtle things like avidda, have been eradicated, then the jitta will cease to exhibit any changes. It will now remain stable and unchanging. As we progress in our practice, the change will steadily occur, following the change of the sammati tammas found within the jitta. There will only be change on the good side, and will become more and more subtle. This is because good is sammati, and so is evil, and so is wholesomeness and unwholesomeness. They are all samadhi. When one has come to this subtle level, one will understand this. And once one has attained and passed beyond this stage, then one will become one who has relinquished or let go of both good and evil. It means that now one has let go of all samadhi, both the good and evil, the coarse and the subtle. One has now let go totally of all samadhi, None of this samuti is found within the jitta anymore. All that is left is just the natural state of knowingness. Therefore, I am not very certain about the translation of the Bali verse that says Zajatta Pariyodapanang, which translates as purify your jitta until it attains the state of luminosity. If it had been translated as purify your jitta to the state of purity, then I could accept this wholeheartedly. Furthermore, consider the Thamma which says, Behold, Bhikkhus, the true original Jitta is luminous, but the Gilesas act like visitors which make the Jitta become dull. The Lord Buddha did actually describe this true original Jitta as the original Jitta of the Vartachakka, the cycle of birth and death. The Lord Buddha did not say that the true original Jitta is purified, and for what reason? This is because the original jitta of each individual has avidda deeply embedded within it, without any exception. That is why the Lord Buddha said, Behold, because the true original jitta is luminous. But it was due to the gilesas that came in, which means that whatever comes into contact with the jitta, the jitta then takes up that object to be its own or itself. This is what is meant by the gilesas coming in as a visitor. The Lord Buddha spoke in Sammati, or mundane, terms. But when one has purified the jitta until reaching the state of purity, then this state of luminosity ceases to be an issue. This is because this state of luminosity, which is stated in the Thammapada, must be met with by the practitioner who will come across it. When he has arrived at this state of luminosity, the jitta that is luminous, then he has come face to face with avidda, 
or the avidya chitta. This luminosity, or the magnificence of avidya, is the most subtle level of the gilesas. Avidya is the most clever and most deceptive of the gilesas. So when one has attained that state, the jitta becomes very luminous and very bright. One then becomes deluded with that state of luminosity. This thing is really like a trap or a deception. It is not the real thing. It is only after this luminosity has broken apart that one attains the state of purity, the purified jitta. This purified jitta doesn't take up any more birth, but the luminous jitta will still take up birth. It is always ready to take up birth because this luminosity itself is the creator of birth. But once this luminosity has been dispersed, then there is nothing left within the jitta. During practice, as one progresses to the different stages, at the stage of samadhi there is one form of calm. It has its own foundation. The firmer the samadhi of the jitta, the firmer will be its foundation. It is not easily shaken by anything, and for this reason samadhi is very good nourishment for the jitta. The jitta will not be restless or agitated, or hunger for anything, because it has samadhi as its nourishment. For this reason, the Lord Buddha taught that one must now develop banya, because now the jitta is full and content. One must take this jitta which is now full and content with samadhi, and put it to work by investigating with banya, for it will then be able to perform its duty at its fullest. It is not like the jitta that is still hungry for other things, because when it investigates in the way of banya, it will all turn into sanya aramana, memory. The only exception to this is when one is driven into a corner and one has no other means. Then one must use banya to do the investigation on some occasions, which I have discussed before, in what we call banya develop samati. This is when one is restless and agitated and one cannot calm down the jitta. One then has to investigate and find out the cause of this agitation and restlessness. This then becomes a special case, a special occasion. Where is this jitta going? One now must begin to investigate and dig into it, not allowing the jitta to go out of the confines of the gamatana, the forty meditation subjects. One must keep on probing, examining, and investigating until eventually the jitta calms down due to the power of banya. One will become very bold and courageous from this practice of banya that can coerce the jitta to enter into calm. When one withdraws from this calm, one feels sublime and majestic, and this is one case of samadhi. The reason for discussing this is because it really happens within the circle of practice for some people, although it might not happen to others. It happened to me, and that is why I have written about it and discussed it. I wrote about my own experiences, and there were no fabrications there. That is how it actually happened. It was when the jitta became restless and agitated, and when I tried to investigate any aspect of tamma, the jitta would not accept it. It kept on going in a different direction, so I had to be tough and strong in trying to discipline the jitta. I had to investigate with banya, using it to round up the jitta. This is similar to being in a close encounter or in close combat, until the jitta cowers and calms down. This manner of calming the jitta with banya can really bring the jitta to be tame. When the jitta enters into calm, it enters with boldness and bravery, and when it withdraws from the state of calm, it does so with courage and it becomes very grand and magnificent. This is one special case, but generally it is the way of samadhi develops banya. Samadhi is the support for banya because samadhi is good nourishment for the jitta. It is the support for banya that lets that banya keep functioning and doing its work without hungering for other things, so that one's investigation doesn't turn into sanya aramana, memory, because the jitta will now perform its function as it has been told, and this is the purpose of samadhi. It is one form of foundation. Now, when one begins to do a lot of investigation with banya, this foundation of samadhi seems to have completely disappeared. But this is not comparable to one who does not have any samadhi at all. This is because the jitta's total awareness now revolves around banya. The awareness of the jitta doesn't remain with the jitta so that it forms samadhi, for it has now come out from the power base of samadhi and now turns to banya. So now the base of samadhi that one used to have has totally disappeared. Where does it go? 
All of it has now gone and concentrated on the development of Banya because the Jitta now does not want to take any rest. So when one wants to enter into calm, one must really force the Jitta to come and rest in Samadhi. When one has to do this, the Jitta will indeed enter into Samadhi, but one must really force it to do so. Once the Jitta no longer goes against our will, then it will have to follow our command. This is because the Satipanya of this level is capable of controlling the Jitta, since at this stage there is nothing except the Jitta and Sati and Banya. There is nothing else to become involved with it. There is nothing that can come and drag away the Jitta, so that when one has to try to coerce the Jitta, it really means that one has to drag the Jitta away from the work that it has been doing. One has to do this dragging away with Sati, so that it can come and rest itself in the state of calm. I had to control and master the jitta to remain calm by using the parikamma object of butto, butto, butto. I haven't forgotten this because I had to repeat it very quickly or else the jitta would go out and do more work. Not that it would have gone out to be immersed in the pleasure of anything, it wouldn't. The jitta had no interest in anything else at all. The jitta at this stage has no interest in anything in the whole universe. It is now totally immersed in the pleasure of doing the investigation with Banya, and that is why at this stage it is called Uttatta, restlessness. That is, it is too engrossed in this investigation, and this is one of the higher fetters, the Sangyodana, for now the Jutta has gone overboard. Instead of resting in the calm of Samadhi so as to replenish itself and recuperate and serve as the base of Banya, it doesn't do so. But when it gets too exhausted, it will eventually have to come and rest in Samadhi when it cannot go any further from exhaustion. It must take a rest. So when it gets too exhausted and tired, to the point when it cannot go on any more, then it must return and rest in the state of Samadhi. After having rested long enough to gain strength and become very light without the burden of the work, then it will just get right back onto the work very energetically and become wholly concentrated on the work of investigation. At this stage, the base or the foundation of Samadhi is no longer there to be found. From my own experience, this is what happens. The base of Samadhi was there during the time when I concentrated my whole effort into the development of calm and Samadhi, but then I was not interested in the investigation of Banya, but when I began to concentrate on my investigation with Banya, then that base of Samadhi entirely disappeared. The base of Samadhi was there during the time when I concentrated my whole effort into the development of calm and Samadhi, but then I was not interested in the investigation of Banya. But when I began to concentrate on my investigation with Banya, then that base of Samadhi entirely disappeared. As far as the luminous jitta is concerned, this is not the base of Samadhi, it is something else. The more banya can cleanse the jitta, then the more luminous the jitta becomes. When it is the time for it to be empty, this emptiness can be seen very clearly. I could see this emptiness, the jitta being empty of the body, the jitta being empty of everything else. Whatever I looked at appeared like shadows. They were just like shadowy images. Looking at a whole mountain or a solid rock, they just appeared like shadowy images. The greater part of the jitta is empty, and it seems that there is no solid rock, just an image of the rock. Walking on the ground, it also appears shadowy. The jitta appeared to have penetrated it. It just happened that way. And as far as the body was concerned, it was comparable to the globe of a pressure lantern, for inside it was very bright and very clear. This is the emptiness of the base of Samadhi, or the emptiness of the base of the jitta. It does not really feel right to describe it as the emptiness of the base of Samadhi, but when I describe it as the emptiness of the base of the jitta, that does feel right. That is, I feel very positive about this description. In the state of Samadhi, it is also empty, but when one begins to focus the jitta on the external things, then it is not empty any more. But when it is empty by virtue of the base of the jitta, then wherever one looks at or focuses on the jitta, everything appears to be empty. But it is not empty of itself. When the time comes for the jitta to finish its work, then it has to come back and investigate itself until it becomes totally empty. Before, wherever one looks, one sees everything as empty, but oneself is not empty. One is still carrying the burden. 
one is still carrying the full load of avidda and tanha. Speaking of this tanha, it is not the coarser kind of tanha. This tanha or desire that we are speaking of refers to the affection for, the intimacy with, and the attachment to the brightness and luminosity of the jitta. One must now investigate at this point. When all this luminosity is broken up, then it truly becomes empty. There are three kinds of emptiness. The emptiness of samadhi, the emptiness of the base of the jitta, and this ultimate emptiness in which everything is empty. Everything external is empty, and the base of the jitta is empty, and the jitta itself is also empty. All problems have disappeared, and there is nothing else to investigate, and one knows this within oneself. One has no doubt or questions about what Sandir Tiko is, that is, knowing within oneself and experiencing this within oneself. Though one might never have known or experienced this before, now one knows, and there is no doubt about it. There is no more problem or work to be done, and one can see this very clearly. What is there to do any more, and what is the object of this work? Now there is nothing to come and be involved with the jitta. The jitta now is just merely the jitta. There is no self, animal, or people, no I or them. They have all disappeared. All forms of sammati and the sammati jitta are no longer apparent. What else is there to do? One has experienced all the hardship in one's exertion from the beginning to the end. The exertion for the development of samadhi is very hard work. It is really hard on the body because one has to abstain from food and sleep or sit for a very long time in samadhi. This is really dukkha. It was very hard in the development of samadhi, and when the citta had established some foundation, it became very hard on the citta, and the more developed the citta became, the more subtle everything got, and the harder the work was. But one is no more concerned about this hardship and difficulty than about the work for the realization for the truth and tamma, and everything that became involved with the jitta. But this hardship was no problem, and when one had fully exerted to one's utmost ability, one would eventually come to conquer the jitta and accomplish one's work. And one zadibanya that has been revolving like a tamma zakka, a wheel of tamma, will also lose its purpose. They all fall into place naturally. One's diligent effort in the application of satipanya that has been so intensified, turning around relentlessly and incessantly, eventually and naturally stops, because there is nothing else to do, there is no more problem to solve, there is nothing to be corrected. Banya is used for correcting and clearing away the gilesas, but is there now a single type of gilesa found within the citta? If one is certain that there is none, then what is there to fight? What is there to cope with, or to struggle with, or encounter? Can you battle or fight with empty wind? There is an end to the work of tamma, but as far as the work of the world is concerned, there can never be an end to it. From the first day of one's birth, there is work to do continuously until the last day of one's life, and even then one has still not finished one's work. People die worried and concerned for their work, their friends, and their relatives. There isn't a single jitta that can pass away with sugato, going to a happy state, without having any worry, analeo, without having any desire left. There are only jittas that die with worry and confusion and entanglement with all sorts of things. So how can there be any happiness when one goes carrying a burden with oneself? The work that one did before one passed away was not completed, and when one passes away, someone else will have to take over one's job. This just continues on and on. There isn't a single person in the world who can accomplish his task, because as soon as he finishes one job, there is a new one coming up all the time. People keep on doing it, but are we going to be bold enough to take up this task as well? Is it possible that we can get into the mundane work and accomplish it before we die? Can you be really certain that you can finish this work? If you are not certain of this, why don't you take up the work that is certain, like the work that the Lord Buddha promised? He said that if you take this work of a recluse and then attain the Vosetang Brahmazariang, that is, the end of the holy life, then you will really complete and accomplish your task. 
There won't be a single Gilesa that could be revived so that it can come and fight with us any more. Once it is totally got rid of 100%, then it is totally got rid of forever. From that moment on, one will never have to be in doubt, for instance by thinking, could this Gilesa arise again now that I have destroyed all of them? It will not happen, for they have now all been destroyed. It has all disappeared. They have all been truly got rid of, and from there onward there is only happiness, ease, and comfort. As far as all the anxiety and worry and confusion is concerned, and all the Gilesas, Dangha, and the Asava that used to afflict one's heart like an erupting volcano are concerned, they have all disappeared. This volcano has been extinguished by the water of the Tamma and the Truth. Extinguished are all the fires of Raga, Dosa, and Moha. They have been quenched by the water of the Madzima Baribada, the middle way of practice. Once the water has been splashed over this fire that has been afflicting the heart and has totally extinguished it, then all that is left is just coolness that will last forever. This is Agaliko, timeless. The Lord Buddha said that this is Agalika Jitta, Agalika Tamma, the timeless Jitta and timeless Tamma. They are both one and the same thing. Once one has arrived at this stage, both the Jitta and Tamma are one and the same thing. One can either call it the Jitta or the Tamma, for there wouldn't be any contradiction. All that is necessary is for the Gilesas, that are notorious for their contradiction, to disappear from the heart. There will not be any contradiction, nothing to go and contravene anything else. One cannot find anything to contradict one, because the Gilesas of contradiction have all disappeared. That is, the Gilesas that contradict Tamma. Once the Gilesas have been wiped out, there is nothing left to contravene, and nothing left to serve as a contradiction. One will then be at ease and peaceful. You see, the work of a bhikkhu does have an end. You must really get into it. Don't be lackadaisical or vacillating or grope in the dark like blind men. Don't be half-hearted and uncommitted, for this is like groping for something when you don't know whether it is an eel or a snake. Then there will only be uncertainty and doubt.